Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A very warm welcome to St. Patrick's Church, Tonic Moor, for this service of morning prayer on the fifth Sunday before Advent. We begin our worship by singing together from thanks and praise number 28, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <coughs> Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. By what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, heart will deliver you from all your sins, keep firm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord, the Lord's name be praised. Our first canticle, part one of the today.
reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment from the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that the son of David by the Spirit calls him the Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my lips and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? Well, it sounds like a reasonable question, doesn't it? It's a question which scholars uh, could debate and theologians could discuss. There could be theories advanced, propositions disputed, and a really interesting discussion take place. But Jesus gives an answer which, at the one level, really isn't very startling. But at another level, it's so deep and so profound that it challenges every conceivable aspect of our thought. But before we even look at what Jesus said, let's put it into context. Because you can never understand a passage of scripture without context. Matthew chapter 21 tells the story of Palm Sunday and the start of Holy Week. The triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple, the challenge to Jesus' authority by the chief priests. Chapter 22 takes us to an, a series of events when people try and trip Jesus up or trap him. First of all, the Pharisees about paying taxes to Caesar, the Sadducees about the resurrection, and then one last time the Pharisees try again, this time sending in the lawyer to pose the question. And you can, when you put it into context, you can feel that sense of tension in the air as you read through these chapters. And then it's followed by some of the harshest, most, most scathing words of Jesus for the religious establishment. As Matthew tells the story, it is not an innocent question. It is the final in a series of traps laid for Jesus. And the next time he faces his accusers will be on Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane when they arrest him. Later in the council when they accuse him and on the cross on Good Friday as they mock him. So Jesus' answer to the lawyer is no mere evasion of a, a tricky question. It's an answer which cuts right through all the bluff and bluster to proclaim the message of the cross and the heart of the gospel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All of the law. The Torah, the 613 commandments contained throughout Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All the words spoken by God through the prophets, by Isaiah, by Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and all the rest of the prophets. All of it taken and distilled into two simple commandments, two short sentences, two instructions. Love God, love your neighbor. What could be simpler? It's a bit like the For Dummies series of books. Here's the gospel for dummies. Take these two simple instructions, you've got the point, you've got the heart, the soul, the essence of the gospel in a nutshell. Far easier, isn't it, than trying to remember rules, laws, regulations. Two is much easier than 613. Doesn't get any more straightforward. Until you start to think about it. 
until you start to really think about the implications of what it means to love. You see, we think of love as a Valentine's card, or a dozen red roses, a box of chocolates, a romantic candlelit dinner, a walk on the beach, hand in hand. When Jesus talks about love, he's not talking about roses and chocolates and romance. He's talking about the sacrificial, self-giving love that is willing to lay down its own life for the beloved. He's talking about what he is going to face in these coming days. The love of the cross to take the punishment that belongs to us. The scourging, the mocking, the crown of thorns, the purple robe. To take upon his own shoulders the pain and suffering and the shame and the humiliation. And to bear it all without complaint and without reproach. You know, John, in his Gospel, chapter 15, verse 13, says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. So when Jesus says, Love the Lord your God, and love your neighbour as yourself, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's telling us we must be prepared to do, to lay down our life, to take up our cross, to really follow him. That is the great commandment on which our faith is built. Not the great option, not the great advice, but the great commandment. When we choose to follow Jesus, that's what we're signing up to. To love, even to the point of laying down our life. The way of love is hard. It's no soft, easy path to walk in the steps of Jesus. But it's the only path in this life which leads us to happiness, to joy, and to fulfillment. What's the opposite of love? It's not a trick question. If you'd asked me this up until recently, I'd have said hate. So I love coffee, I hate tea. I love red wine, I hate sparkling water. Primary school stuff, opposites, love, hate. But then, recently I heard a sermon by Bishop Michael Curry. He's the bishop who became famous when he preached at the wedding of Harry and Meghan a few years ago. And he said something which made me stop and think. He said, no, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, he's nailed it, hasn't he? If love were an emotion, the opposite emotion might be to hate. But biblical love, Christian love, is not an emotion. It's an action. It's all about giving of self, caring, self-sacrifice. And so the opposite action is selfishness. When we discover that truth, I think we've discovered something profound about following Jesus. It's hard work to love your neighbour, isn't it? I try to love my neighbours every day. Many of them are easy to love. Some of them are challenging to love and some of them are just downright impossible to love. But don't forget, the commandment of Jesus includes to love yourself. We cannot love our neighbours until we love ourselves. So we try to live according to Jesus' words and commandments. We find that we're not completely changed, renewed. There are still flaws and impurities and darknesses lurking within us. Sometimes we feel like we're succeeding in following him. Other times like we're floundering helplessly. And that's why I started by putting the passage into context. Jesus isn't just throwing down a commandment and saying, here's a commandment, follow it. Jesus is giving us an invitation and a promise about a different way of life. A way where he has gone before and we can follow him. The death and resurrection of Jesus are pointing us forward to new life, to the breaking of the power of sin and death, the throwing open of the gifts of glory, the power of new life beyond and, and before the grave. The way of Jesus says the way of life, the way of love. But it forces us to make a choice. Which path are you walking on? Is it the path of selfishness? Or is it the way of love? The way of the cross? Are you prepared to love the Lord your God? Not just a little bit, 
not just on a Sunday morning, not just when you feel a special need of God's protection or God's presence or God's answer to prayer, but are you prepared to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength? Are you prepared to take up your cross and walk in the steps of Jesus of Nazareth, even if it means loving your neighbor so much that you lay down your life for them? The choice is clear and the results are clear. One path leads to happiness, but only one path. One path leads to contentment and peace and joy, but it's not the easy path. Will you commit to walking that path, following that way, accepting the cost of love and paying the price of love? All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. But more than that, our eternal destiny, our eternal salvation, and, and our present happiness all hang on those two commandments, on choosing to follow that path. Follow Jesus. Or follow the reflection you see in the mirror each morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks and praise number 134. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
how to profess the faith of our baptism as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again. dying in faith, rejoice to see you as you are. We thank you for the example and commend them to your peace forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as an act of fellowship, we pray together the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the 
love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Our final hymn of praise, number 84, Hallelujah, raise the anthem, let the skies resound with praise. Sing to him who found the ransom, ancient of eternal days. gracious mercy and protection we commend you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.